Hello, good morning. Today our guest is Ambassador David Shin. Hello, Ambassador Shin. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, Lepin. Thank you. I am great. So I love your blog and I love your work. So Ambassador, tell us a little about your career. Uh, I began as a foreign service officer in, in the U.S. diplomatic service in 1964, uh, but I had something of an unusual career in that almost all of it had to do with Africa. Uh, normally in the foreign service, you, you spend more time going to different parts of the world. Uh, I did not. Uh, all, all but one of my tours was in Africa and ended up uh, as ambassador to Burkina Faso in the late 80s and then ambassador to Ethiopia in the late 90s. Uh, I've been teaching at George Washington University since 2001, uh, African Affairs. All right. And how would you describe your sojourn in Africa? Well, I certainly have no regrets about having spent a career, basically a career either in Africa or dealing with Africa in the State Department in Washington. I found it to be a fascinating continent, one that uh, is not well understood in the United States, uh, one that is not given a great deal of attention in the United States, but nevertheless an important continent and one that I, I think we should be paying more attention to. Uh, unfortunately, that's not been the case. I agree with you, Ambassador. For example, as a student of African history, I'm interested in the Aksumite Empire, Mali, and preserving documents that are presently presently being held in, in Mali. And I just find it surprising that the U.S. has not done more to seriously engage Africa. So, for example, we do know Africa is rich in re resources. In resources, it is a diverse continent, both intellectually, socially, and politically. Africa just pre presents a fascinating new era for further research. And it's quite shocking that enough specialists in American foreign policy are not paying significant at attention to Africa. So for example, the Russians are, invested, are investing in the resource sectors in Africa, but America has better technology and managerial capabilities to boost those sectors. So if, uh, if in order, one, one way for Africa to move up the value chain would be to cooperate with America, wouldn't you agree? I, I would. Of course, part of the issue here is that the United States is, is based, uh, the economy is based largely on a private sector model. That means that the American private sector has to take an interest in a place like Africa uh, if you're going to have much engagement. And if you have a state-run economy, as you have in, say, China, uh, or you previously had in the in the Soviet Union, and even to some extent in Russia today, uh, you have a very different model for interacting with Africa. And if the private sector, American private sector, is not particularly interested in investing in Africa or trading uh, with Africa, not much is going to happen. There's not a great deal that the United States government can do to force that to happen. There are some incentives, uh, such as the Export-Import Bank and a, a new uh, development fund uh, that has uh, been created in the last three or four years that will help encourage investment and trade with Africa. But it's, it's still difficult to, um, to try to force any private sector organization to take an interest in an area that it's not inherently interested in. You're right. And the factor in endowments are different. Many of the leading companies in America are investing in finance, technology, and the service sector. And these are areas in Africa it's still in need of development. Furthermore, in countries like Nigeria, property rights are insecure. And the Amer American businessmen do not appreciate bureaucracy. They, they don't. Now, I, I should... Uh not denigrate all American companies. Some are quite active in Africa and have good businesses there. But there are too many American companies that have not shown much interest in the continent, uh, particularly smaller and medium-sized companies. Uh, the, 
the bigger companies like Boeing or General Electric or IBM, Caterpillar, uh, they know Africa and they're engaged there, but uh, there are an awful lot of American companies with minimal involvement in Africa. I think that people who are interested in building up startup on startup entrepreneurs and mobile money investors should target Kenya. Africa is ripe for mobile money investment. Uh, it is. This is an area, though, where some other countries are ahead of the United States in terms of um, their uh, both their technology and their interest in penetrating foreign markets. Uh, this is not an area where the U.S. has been in the lead. Uh, so there's there's a significant uh, disadvantage for the U.S. in this area in a, a developing uh, continent like Africa. And another point is that traditional medicine in Africa is respected. I have done some research on traditional plant-based medicines in other country, but the, far, well, traditional medicines could be competing with the pharmaceutical sector in the U US, but a part of capitalism is to rebrand our products. So I think that should be a great idea if pharmaceutical companies in, in the States could spend some amount of money on R&D to study the medicinal, the medicinal benefits of African plants. I, I think that this is an untapped frontier. Yeah, again, it's, it's an area where the United States uh, sort of medical sector has ne never shown uh, particular interest uh, in the, in the uh, traditional medicine field. Uh, countries like China have a much longer history of um, accepting traditional medicine. I'm not an expert on traditional medicine, I'm sure. Some of it is quite useful. I think other elements of it, uh, both in uh, Africa and perhaps in China too, uh, are not that useful. Yes. But, uh, there are elements that, that can be adapted and, uh, and utilized uh, profitably, but it's, uh, it's, not an, it's not been a good area for US-Africa interaction just because the US has, has followed a different kind of, of uh, medical path. I, I do agree with you. I only support plant-based medicine when it is corroborated by the science. So, for example, in the context of COVID, some people are claiming that they went to the doctor and me modern medicine failed to, cure, failed to cure them of the disease. However, they relied on some bush medicine or some other form of traditional medicine, and as a result, they were cured. I'm not in a position to verify these stories, but COVID is a pandemic with an economic cost, and entrepreneurs must be willing to take new risk. Oh, I think that's correct, and, and um, a few in the United States do, but as I say, most have not shown any particular interest in pursuing traditional medicine in Africa or anywhere else for that matter. Because they believe that traditional medicine will compete with pharmaceuticals, but the pharmaceutical companies, if they were smart, would monopolize that sector. Well, you, you, have, a, you have a good point. Uh, I, I think we might wait a long time though, for that to happen uh, in the case of the United States. Yes, because COVID, as I, said, as I said earlier, is a serious pandemic. After being vaccinated, some persons have contracted the disease, some have even died. Therefore, if there's a newer opportunity to cure people, it should be on the table. We have to try all channels. Yeah, that, that's just sim simply common sense. It's but, been used in order to deal with COVID. Yes, no. but, but back to Africa. This, you may go ahead. This, this is an area, of course, where the United States has, has been, I think, very successful in developing several very good vaccines for uh, preventing at least the worst effects of COVID. Uh, we've not been so good at exporting it to other parts of the world yet because we haven't completely dealt with it in the United States, but um, at least good medicine has been developed in the United States, which I think is probably better than that which has been developed in any other part of the world. Exactly. There was a, a study was recently done comparing the efficacy of 
the Moderna vaccine to Pfizer vaccine. And at some point, we must admit that COVID is a new disease and as such, the vaccines are not perfect. Capitalism is an innovative process and a risk-taking process. It's about trial and error. And we have to try until we discover the, the cure or unlock a vaccine that is more suitable. But COVID as a disease has the propensity to multiply rapidly. And this has flabbergasted many, but neither of us are, are expert in, in this era. So we're going to get back to Africa. But COVID has, has blindsided all of us. Ambassador, why is Africa so marginal to the broader foreign policy goals of the U.S.? Marginal. Well, th yeah, this is a, an historical development. Uh, Africa has always been the, the least um, significant continent or large land area in terms of American foreign policy. And essentially what you have to do is compare it to all of the other major regions of the world. And Africa, just by process of elimination, uh, comes out at the bottom. Uh, for example, Europe has uh, obviously had long historical ties, uh, both uh, in terms of ethnicity and the, the, uh, the links, to the, law, the strong links with Europe over the centuries. Uh, Latin America is closer to the United States, also has some important um, uh, ethnic ties to the United States. Uh, Asia is, has been particularly important because of um, the economy, the very important economies of Asia, the large population in Asia. Asia. So it has traditionally uh, been more important to the US than, um, than Africa has. And even the Middle East, uh, South Asia has been, I think, more uh, important to the US in large part because of all of the conflict that has gone on there and in part because of the oil resources of the region. But it too has um, sort of been ahead of, of Africa in terms of, of US foreign policy. And then that leaves Africa uh, as sort of uh, last on the list. And that's the way it has been uh, pretty much since the end of World War II. And of course, prior to World War II, it's important to recall that very few countries in Africa were independent. They were colonies of European countries. So the relationships with the United States was with the European um, mother country and not with the colonial uh, organization in, um, in Africa. So there are some important historical reasons why the relationships developed as they did with Africa. Yes, and I, do, I don't believe that this approach will be altered anytime soon. Even though based on my readings, Africa has immense potential, but as you, you noted earlier, Africa has been at a disadvantage due to political crises, but the crises that occurred in the Middle East were more significant for, for Americans, whereas the, the reverse is true for Africa. They, they were relatively insignificant. For example, oil, Africa, Nigeria has some advantage in oil, but on average countries in, in Africa are not major in the oil producing sector. Another issue is terrorism. Terror, the, the, Middle, the Middle East is, is the hotbed for terrorism. In Africa, there is the, in, the, in the former territories of the Sokoto Caliphate and Northern Nigeria, there are various terrorist groups, but the threat that, that, uh, that is in the Middle, the Middle East is more, perver more pervasive. So Americans will have a stronger intent, to, in, intent, would have a stronger incentive to contain the, th the, th the threat of terror in the Middle East. I think that's correct. Uh, there, there is a uh, an interest uh, in the issue of terrorism by the United States government. It's um, it's probably caused the United States to pay more attention to Africa than any other single issue. And although it's waned a bit in the last uh, several years, I think you're starting to see something of a return of American interest 
uh, in Africa as a result of uh, growing terrorist concerns, particularly in the Sahel region of uh, Africa. Uh, to some extent, the ongoing problem in Somalia. Uh, but this, um, this has been the one major issue in the 21st century, which, which has brought American attention to Africa. Exactly. And N N Nigeria, Nigeria is a country that is just beaming with, with potential in oil, in natural resources, and it has a growing technology sector. It's, it's a populous country, one of the richer countries in Africa based on GDP. And Nigeria is also politically unstable. Th therefore, if, if, um, if, if U.S. foreign policy was uh, well, po the point that I'm making is that real politics is important. U.S. For foreign policy is based on real politics. So even though we often argue that Americans want to promote democracy and help other parts of the world, foreign policy is still based on strategic interests. Because if Ni if a country like Nigeria, the heart of Africa, was more strategic to the to the United States, then we would we would be seeing greater levels of foreign direct investment by the private sector, even though America is an economy that is more free market when compared to China and Russia. The private sector in America can operate independent of the state, but in the realm of politics, or should we say geopolitics, the state and the private sector have a marriage. So if if Africa becomes strategically important to U.S. foreign policy, do you believe then the private sector will begin to venture into, into Africa to seek new opportunities? Uh, I think it depends more upon whether the private sector sees an opportunity to make a profit. If they see profit opportunities, they will engage to a greater extent. Uh, they will not necessarily engage just because the U.S. government sees Africa as strategically more important, unless that results in making available more government incentives uh, to the private sector, more funding from the Export-Import Bank, for example, uh, or this, uh, this new financial uh, institution that's designed to encourage investment in Africa uh, and the rest of the world. It, it really is more a question of profitability than I think uh, strategic interest. And yes, we, we don't want rent seeking to drive the growth of the private sector in Africa. But Ambassador Shin, as someone who spent several years on the continent, how best do you think that Africans can scale up? In other words, what are some of the big reforms to make growth more conducive to outside investors who are not usually interested in the continent? Well, particularly if you look at it from the standpoint of um, the American private sector, which I, I can uh, refer to most authoritatively, uh, you have to have a better record at um, preventing and stopping conflict on the continent than the Africans have shown so far. When you have 54 African countries, inevitably, you're going to get several that are in almost constant turmoil just because of their sheer numbers. But Africa has had more than its share of, um, of countries in conflict or in turmoil. That scares off the private sector. It basically concludes that, look, there are other parts of the world that are more stable where we can make a profit why should we gamble on an African country that 10 years from now uh, may be in conflict? Uh, who would have guessed, for example, that Ethiopia would be in the conflict that it is in today? Uh, I would not have guessed it, and yet it is. And it's, how, it's taking a terrible toll on the economy of Ethiopia. Uh, you can go down the line and probably identify at least two dozen countries in Africa in recent years that have gone from relative stability uh, to conflict. Now, some have gone the other way. Some have gone from conflict to relative stability. Countries like Liberia, uh, Sierra Leone, Angola, they've gone the right direction. Uh, Mozambique, to some extent, although Mozambique is having some new problems with stability up north. 
But conflict is, um, is one of the major reasons why the, private, the American private sector has been reluctant to go into the continent. Another problem is still the relative uh, inefficiency of infrastructure in Africa. A lot of progress has been made, both in terms of human infrastructure and physical infrastructure that has made the continent more attractive to investors, but there's a long way to go yet. And the African countries by and large are not competitive with Asian countries or Latin American countries when it comes to infrastructure. Uh, I would also suggest that um, an element of democracy is sought by American companies. I think American companies are a little reluctant to to go into highly authoritarian, dictatorial uh, run countries in Africa or anywhere else. They would rather deal with the government that at least has the basic elements of democracy. And there just are, are too many cases yet in Africa where authoritarianism uh, is the prevailing uh, way of governing. Africa is remarkably remarkably diverse and according to some experts like easterly and living ethnolinguistic fragmentation to an extent can account for conflict and some also attribute conflict in africa to the nature of pre-colonial institutions but you you're an expert in in african history and you said that the ethiopian conflict surprised you so before i before I begin to ask, before you shed some light on the conflict in Ethiopia, why were you surprised? Uh, Ethiopia has a long and, and proud history, uh, also has a history of conflict because way back uh, over the millennia. So in, in that sense, one perhaps should not be surprised. And it has is, um, is a relatively recent history of conflict uh, during the the period uh, of the Derg regime that uh, was in power from 1974 to, uh, to 1991. Uh, so in that sense, perhaps I shouldn't have been as surprised, but we, we saw in 1991, a, an authoritarian regime establish pretty firm control on the country. And I think we, to some extent, misjudged how that would play out. Um, I saw that as, um, as sort of uh, extending into the future, not necessarily the same government, but a different type of government that would be in a position to maintain control through <clears throat> relatively authoritarian means for better or worse. And that is all coming apart now. And it, um, as a result, surprises me that it has disintegrated to the degree that it has. Uh, I hope that all can come back together and, and Ethiopia can remain a united country without um, breaking into pieces. But I fear that there is the possibility uh, at this juncture of breaking into pieces. And, and what is the immediate cause of the present conflict in Ethiopia? <laughs> because as I said earlier, you, you're a historian and I'm a student of history and studying the, studying the history of Ethiopia, conflicts are not unusual. During the medieval ages, there was conflict between, the, between Christians in Ethiopia and the Muslims. There was conflict with Eritrea. So from, an, from a position of history, I am not surprised that there is conflict today. But for our readers, give us the immediate background to the conflict. I think the immediate uh, reasons, and, and they're not really so immediate, they, they also go back historically. Although when you look at, at a country like Ethiopia historically, very, very strong leaders, uh, either kings or emperors or effectively dictators, uh, have sort of held the place together through sheer force. Uh, but the the problems have been based on ethnic differences going back over many, many uh, hundreds of years. And they have now <clears throat> come back to the fore in a way that is, is creating all kinds of um, divisiveness in the country. 
Ethiopia is the second most populous country in Africa. It's about 110 million people. There are some 80 to 85 different ethnic groups. Some of them are very small and, and therefore not, not particularly significant politically. But there are several that are, are quite large and politically significant that are vying for power. Uh, and they all think that they should have a certain advantage when it comes to being in power. And that creates an inherently unstable situation. Uh, if you can get them all to work together for the greater good of the Ethiopian people, then that's fine. Um, the country works and is successful and you have a, a strong economy. But when they start, start um, competing against each other, particularly for power, then it starts to come apart. And that, I'm afraid, is what we're seeing at the moment. Ambassador, would a multi-state solution be feasible for individual countries in Africa? In other, what, in other words, would it make more sense to just split up some of these countries into minor states? You know, I, that, that's a really hard question yes. to answer. Um, there, there actually probably are some cases where that is true, but there would be other instances where that would be uh, create more problems than it would solve. Uh, and then you get to the point of how small of an entity do you create and call it a state? Uh, I don't think anyone is suggesting that there should be 80 to 85 different countries in a place like Ethiopia. That makes no sense whatsoever. No, no, not none. And you have some other countries in Africa have more than 85 ethnic groups. You know, a country like Nigeria, for example. Um, so you, you get to the point of how, how do you divide a, a place up? How, how, do you, how do you make borders? Uh, we all understand that the colonial borders are very arbitrary and in many cases made little sense. Uh, but at the same time, it's pretty hard to come up with a plan that would have uh, pretty much guaranteed that there not be conflict among different groups on the continent, no matter how you divide it up. And the idea of having hundreds and hundreds of individual countries in Africa, uh, in my view, doesn't make any sense. Uh, at the same time, you can't have one, just one Africa. There are those who argue that well, we should just have one country, call it, call it Africa. Well, that isn't going to work either. Somewhere in there, there's a happy medium where you minimize the amount of conflict I'm not saying you eliminate it. You probably never do. I don't think conflict has been eliminated in any part of the world when it comes to drawing borders. Uh, and certainly it's not likely to happen in Africa. But this is a really hard thing to do. Um, and it certainly could have been done differently and more efficiently, but it, I don't think ever would have been done perfectly. The, the duration of the state in Africa is not as extensive as other places. One philosopher argued that Africa's gift to the world is its absence of formalized states. Today, we live in a world driven by state, and I do agree with you. We shouldn't have 85 different countries in Ethiopia, but what about creating autonomous legal zones or a form of what some economists refer to as polycentric sovereignty? So if we cannot create multiple states in one country, have one powerful state and allow, the, and, and, and allow other territories to have centers of authority. In other words, we would devolve sovereignty, devolve authority. Well, so, some African countries have, have tried that um, with different degrees of success over a period of time, including Ethiopia. I mean, Ethiopia was uh, based on on ethnic federalism. Uh, now there are those today who vehemently oppose the concept of, of ethnic federalism. There are others who still would like to see some form of it. Um, Somalia is trying to deal with a, a decentralized system of governance and it's having a lot of trouble with it. Um, the, the central government is not a strong government. 
and it's not been able to hold all the pieces together. And in addition, you have a, a very important Al Shabaab uh, terrorist movement, which uh, interrupts the process. A country like Nigeria try, has tried a, a form of, of federalism. Um, so there, there have been different um, approaches to governance in Africa, that some of which have worked fairly well for a period of time, but all of them seem to run into some difficulties at some point in time. Uh, I'm not sure that anyone has quite figured out how to make it work over the long term. The, the more dictatorial regimes may have worked well for 20, 30, 40 years, and then people get fed up with um, having so much decision-making made by so few, and they end up being toppled, as we saw in Sudan recently. Uh, so the, the exact way forward is not clear, in my view, for the vast majority of African countries. Some have been fairly lucky, country like Botswana, uh, where there is not a great deal of ethnic difference, and they have uh, been relatively democratic. Uh, Mauritius has done the same thing. Cape Verde has done this. They tend to be the smaller countries in Africa, uh, but they have so far shown that they can work. And even some of the more complicated countries like Senegal have done fairly well. Uh, Kenya, with all of its uh, ethnic problems over the years, it still manages to mm. maintain a relatively democratic form of government. Uh, Tanzania, although with some variations in leadership, uh, has also managed to work as, a, as an entity, as a country. Uh, so there are examples where, the, uh, for relatively long periods of time, African countries have put together a system that works reasonably well. But too many have not. Too many have um, uh, have been overthrown, uh, or or removed, or significantly changed um, uh, out of necessity. Africa is a paradox. On one account, the absence of long-term formalized states deter development, and on the other account. Polycent polycentric sovereignty could be feasible. But I think that my first point is stronger. So I'm glad you, you mentioned Botswana and Mauritius. Botswana and Mauritius both invested in state capacity. In the 70s and 80s, they retooled the bureaucracy and their bureaucracies were never politicized. Furthermore, pre-colonial institutions in Botswana impose constraints on leaders. So state capacity can explain the divergence in income between Botswana and other countries in Africa. So it's, it's, an, it's an intricate mix of the right amount of state capacity and polycentric sovereignty or in our libertarianism. But Africa really needs to augment state capacity. African states are weak and weak states cannot perform. They have a difficulty in collecting taxes and in pacifying the population. I think that's true. And it also depends on either good leadership or relatively good leadership. If you have bad leaders, uh, even a country that otherwise should do well, will not because the leadership is either corrupt or uh, it has uh, serious uh, imperfections. Le leadership is param paramount. There is a paper arguing that Africa's first leaders make a big difference. So educated leaders were more likely to leach center or right instead of left. Today, their countries on average are, are better off. Some, some scholars call it the long-term determinants of leadership. And again, oh, Botswana think, is a classic example. I think that's correct. Yeah. And, and research also finds that African leaders who studied abroad, they're more adept at attracting investment. And it's, it's not necessarily due to higher levels of education. Exposure to foreign countries will increase networking opportunities. So if you're, so if you're an African interested in networking and investment, maybe, and this is a big me, maybe it is better to appoint a leader who studied at Harvard versus a local university in Nigeria or Tanzania. 
Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be a little careful with that's why uh, I said me. It's a big me. With that, because there, there certainly are exceptions where some leaders who have studied at prestigious universities abroad have come back and made a mess of their um, of their country. So it, it doesn't always work that way because they absorb socialist rhetoric. Jomo Jomo Kenyatta and many others they they have, they absorb socialist rhetoric so this could be could be a factor well i think there there are many reasons for it but um there there certainly are cases where education abroad has not been helpful to uh, contribute to good leadership yes and and one who studied abroad expect especially for a longer period of time may no longer be in sync with local realities but Africa is just an interesting and complicated and complicated place to study. No, 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 Ambassador. China is the new player in Africa. During 2000 to 2014, the Chinese spent 350 billion US on development programs in Africa. Some have characterized this relationship as a new form of neocolonialism. Do you agree with this sentiment? Well, basically I don't, uh, but there are two elements of, of your comment that I would, uh, I would take exception to. Um, the first one is the amount of money that China has put into Africa. It's important to keep in mind, most of that uh, consists of loans it has to be paid back by African governments. So it is not uh, foreign direct investment. Uh, China's foreign direct investment in Africa is quite modest. It's much, much lower than European uh, foreign direct investment. And it's probably uh, cumulatively about the same, maybe a little less than American foreign direct investment in the continent. What China has done so much of is making loans available far more than um, the United States has done, uh, more than what the European countries are doing today. Uh, cumulatively, I think the uh, European countries have loaned far more money to Africa than China has. But in, in recent years, China has been in the lead on, on uh, providing loans. Uh, this, of course, does create debt issues, uh, at least in some countries. And that is starting to be a problem uh, in China's relationship with several African countries. Now, not all African countries, it's very important to be specific here. There, there are probably you know, 15 or 16 African countries today that the um, International Monetary Fund has identified as being either in debt distress uh, or in, in threat of debt distress. And if you take those 15 countries, uh, China is probably the primary source of loans for about half of them, uh, which means that the other half are getting their money from somewhere else, either private banks or uh, the World Bank, uh, Arab Development Bank, African Development Bank, et cetera. But nevertheless, China is a contributor to this problem. Uh, China is the major trade partner with Africa today, has been since 2009, uh, surpassing the United States, and it continues to hold that lead by a fairly wide margin. Uh, on the other hand, uh, China-Africa trade has been fairly flat in the last uh, five years or so. It's starting to rise again slowly, but the high point of China-Africa trade was 2015. It has not yet gotten back to the level that it was at in 2015. And if you look at aid levels uh, to Africa, the Europeans are the big players, uh, not China. China is a relatively small provider of aid uh, to the African countries and much, much smaller than the United States. Uh, Chinese aid to uh, Africa is estimated to be at somewhere between 1.5 and 2.5 um, billion dollars a year. Uh, American aid to Africa is about $9 billion a year. So it's important to put China in, in context in terms of 
of what it's doing and where it's truly important and where it's not so important. Another area where it's fairly important, it is one of the primary sources of selling arms to Africa, not as important as Russia, but not far behind Russia. Um, the United States is also fairly high as, a, as an exporter of arms to Africa, although it's mainly to North Africa. Uh, China is more predominant in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, if you look at the military uh, security connection, uh, China's engagement in Africa is still quite minimal, except for support for UN peacekeeping operations where it has about 2,000 uh, person Chinese assigned to UN peacekeeping operations in Africa. That's a lot more than the US has in peacekeeping, UN peacekeeping operations, but it's a lot fewer than Rwanda or Ethiopia or India or Bangladesh has in Africa. So again, it's important to put all of this in context. Now, what does that mean in terms of, of neocolonialism? Well, in, in my view, I, I don't think that what China is doing in Africa constitutes at least what I define as colonialism or neo-colonialism in Africa, in that there is no real effort to extend Chinese government control uh, in Africa. I think what, what China is doing in Africa is mercantilism. Uh, it is extracting huge quantities of natural resources uh, from Africa, uh, oil and minerals, and it is exporting huge quantities of value-added goods, uh, telecommunications equipment, vehicles, military equipment, um, every conceivable kind of consumer good uh, that goes to Africa. And at least in recent years, China has had a large trade surplus with, uh, with the African countries collectively. Uh, to me, this is a classic definition of mercantilism. And that is how I think one ought to describe the current relationship rather than using the term neo-colonialism. I agree with you, um, Ambassador. And what's also interesting is that experts in Africa do not perceive this relationship as neo-colonial. So for, so for example, one, one, amb one ambassador, Ramat, Ramatala Mohammed Osman actually criticized the West for criticizing China. Africans do appreciate the ascent of China in the region. Yes, there are problems, but these problems are, are, have been exaggerated by the Western media. Real evidence compiled by researchers at John Hopkins actually suggests that the relationship does not constitute near colonialism. So for example, China is often attacked for its levels of investment in the in the extractive sector in Africa. However, Mehari Tadeli Maru, an African scholar, argues that this is inapt. So for example, about one third of Chinese investments are in the extractive sector. And China's share in extractive investment in Africa in the form of mining, for example, is lower, and he cites ample data. Uh, it's, it's true that uh, China's foreign direct investment in Africa has been shifting over the years. Uh, initially, it was heavily in the extractive sector, particularly in, in oil and mining. Uh, it continues to be fairly significant in that sector, but it has moved increasingly uh, into manufacturing and the service sector, even banking, which would be service sector. Uh, so it has moved away from the extractive sector and more into these other areas, which is a, is a good thing. Um, but it, it's, it still continues to uh, occur in the extractive sector. And it, as a result, uh, the, I gather the current percentage is about one third of its foreign direct investment. But my, my uh, most important point is that China's foreign direct investment in Africa is quite minimal. It's just not that significant. And this is one of the great misunderstandings about the China-Africa relationship because China has been so important in providing loan money financing 
the assumption is being made that it is equally important in foreign direct investment. And that's just not the case. It's um, primarily the European countries that are involved in foreign direct investment. And increasingly, the, uh, the Gulf states in, uh, uh, in the Middle East, um, countries like India are investing more in, in Africa. So you're, you're seeing a wide variety of foreign direct investment in Africa that is coming from all kinds of locations other than China. Exactly. And they and China may have the edge in Africa because as the, the writer notes, the Chinese have provided unconditional soft loans and access to capital, quick delivery of services and cheap goods, funding of peacekeeping and an, and an alternative development model. And we can never for, forget its investments in ICT in Africa. Correct, and, and China's done very well in the, uh, the telecommunications sector in Africa. They've, they've come up with uh, good, relatively good products at low prices, and that's exactly what the Africans are looking for. Uh, the quality of uh, European and American products may be better than what China is offering, but they're more expensive, and the Africans uh, tend to prefer something that is adequate, but inexpensive. And China has, uh, has filled that void uh, very well. They're also in the lead on, on 5G technology in Africa and convincing African governments to adopt uh, Huawei's system of 5G rather than that provided by, say, Nokia. So the and this person would agree with you. I'm, I'm citing many African experts. His name is Ambassador Ogbole Amidu Ode. He's Nigerian. He was the, the Nigeria's immediate past envoy to Singapore. And he contends that Africans, Africa's investment in, in, in Africa is well appreciated because of resource management and, and how it has improved the quality of infrastructure, especially IT and he's welcoming more investment. Correct, again, it's, it's very important to make the distinction between foreign direct investment uh, from a Chinese company and or as opposed to a Chinese loan that has to be paid back. And a lot of the IT engagement uh, by China in Africa has been in the form of loans uh, for example, Ethiopia has been probably the single biggest beneficiary of IT loans, but it also has an enormous amount of debt uh, built up uh, with China because of that. And the, the, the ambassador gives an example. Not many Nigerians know that China helped develop and launch the Nigerian communication satellite, N Nigerian Comsat One, or that, that, that's the name of the program. And he also argues that China and Nigeria have formed partnerships to explore space and, and other pro-scientific issues. The Americans are not rushing to Nigeria to invest in space technologies. So why would, so why would Africans choose the, the West over China when China is a major game in town? And I do agree with you. You have delineated the nature of Ch Chinese investment, but the point still remains. The Chinese seem to be more interested in Africa. And not only is this significant, but China did, did not have a colony in Africa. And Africans have mentioned this point. They said that the Chinese did not sell slaves, whereas the French had colonies in Africa, like the British. And Russia, unlike the West, is, is, is politically and philosophically different. So Russia and China can Re redefined th themselves differently from the West in order to attract investment and support of the local population. You, you mentioned the issue of, of space, which is an interesting topic and a relatively new one for Africa, and cited particularly the case of Nigeria. And you're absolutely right. China has uh, been very much engaged with Nigeria's space program. Uh, in fact, the um, the first uh, satellite that it launched, um, after a couple of years, there was uh, some sort of 
disconnect with the satellite and it, uh, it ended up failing and they had to launch another one. But the fact is, as you say, Nigeria has stayed with China when it comes to the launching of satellites. But it, again, it's important to look at, at this in the context of the entire continent. And it's actually Russia that has launched more satellites for African countries than any other country. Uh, I believe that both the United States and France are also slightly ahead of China in the launching of satellites throughout Africa. Uh, China has launched six satellites for African countries, uh, two in Nigeria, uh, two in uh, Ethiopia, one or two in Egypt, and I, I may be missing one country here, but it's a total of six. And the United States and France are slightly ahead of that, and Russia is quite a bit ahead of that. So even in the area of space, uh, although China is an important player, it is competing with other countries, uh, both Western and non-Western, uh, in Africa. So it, it's important to put, keep all of this in context. Uh, or there are so many countries in Africa, there's so much diversity that it's very hard to generalize about the continent. And uh, Ambassador, you, you may have been familiar with this research. It was on the internet for a long time, but let me just re 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 remind you. Deborah Brottingham of John Hopkins University writes, writes that surveys of employment in Ch on Chinese projects in Africa repeatedly find that three quarters or more of the workers are in fact local. Again, debunking the, the perception that the Chinese are underemploying African liberals. She and their colleagues at John Hopkins and Boston University began tracking loans provided by China in 2000. In Africa, they found that China had lent at least 95.5 billion between 2000 and 2015. That's a lot of debt, debt. Yet, by and large, the Chinese loans in their database were, were performing a useful service, financing Africa's serious infrastructure gap. On a continent where over 600 million Africans have no access to electricity, 40% of the Chinese loans paid for power generation and transmission. Another 30% went to modernizing Africa's crumbling transport infrastructure. The stories of large land, the stories of large scale land grabbing and the Chinese peasants being shipped to Africa to grow food for China turned out to be mostly myths. Yeah, I've, I've read all of those studies. I'm, I'm very familiar with what they have done at the, uh, at the center at Johns Hopkins University for, uh, for China-Africa uh, studies. And they, they've done some good work there. Uh, again, it, it is important to, to put everything in context. And while it, it may be true that three quarters of all of the workers on Chinese uh, contracts and projects in Africa are, are African. Uh, it would also be interesting to compare, how, compare that with uh, projects run by Europeans or Americans or Indians or others. And I'm willing to bet that an even higher percentage of the local labor is African on the non-Chinese projects than on the Chinese projects. So while uh, one quarter uh, may sound like a relatively small percentage, I'm pretty sure the, the percentage is even smaller in the case of other countries. Ambassador, I just love your analysis this morning. You're on fire. <laughs> <laughs> You're fine. Yeah, 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 few analysts on TV today can discuss the issue as eloquently as you can. And as I said before earlier in our private correspondence, this is why I started the channel because the quality of discourse is just appallingly low. You're, you're right. There, there is um, an enormous amount of misunderstanding uh, about Africa generally. And particularly, I would argue the China-Africa relationship. And I would 
I would put the United States right uh, near the top of the category of countries where the understanding is is so poor, and it's unfortunate that it happens to be that way, but it is. Um, I think European countries, uh, the, the publics are somewhat more knowledgeable uh, about Africa, uh, perhaps because they're closer to the continent, they have the long-standing colonial relationship with, uh, with Africa. Um, China is another country that has a very poor understanding of, um, of Africa. I, I travel uh, frequently in, in China and I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm not surprised, but I'm taken aback at how little understanding there is among most Chinese about Africa. I would say that there's even less understanding in China than there is in the United States. And that's saying a lot. Uh, Ambassador, there's a book written by someone called Don Wyatt, and it's titled The Blacks of Pre-Modern China. And in it, he argued that China enslaved. It's, it's complicated because some reviewers have contended that some of his arguments could be an embellishment. But if you didn't read it, you should. And I'm just saying this for those who contend that the Chinese at no point enslaved Blacks, because this is one edge that China has over Europeans. Europeans enslaved Blacks, Chi the Chinese did not. But there are different views. It's, it's titled the Blacks of Pre-Modern China. No, I'm, I'm not... Uh, yeah, not I would just discover to the book recently, like literally a few weeks ago. It's easy to read, over 100 pages, and I found it online. Yeah, I was just... Okay. Discover yes, but China... It, the Ch you are right again the, the chinese don't know enough about africa especially and we and this is gleaned especially when we con consume videos black people in china are quite rare blacks are a rarity in, in china europeans and, and americans are more familiar with africans but the chinese are smart and politically clever they're able to weaponize identity politics so Racism, according to some, is on the increase in the states, although this is not supported by data because I've done extensive research on the topic. But the Chinese have managed to weaponize crises in America to deflect from their own shortcomings in Africa. Well, I, I think that's correct. In the United States, of course, we're more willing to acknowledge uh, some of our faults and, and to discuss these things openly. Uh, whereas they cannot be discussed openly in China, which is a big, big difference. Um, we certainly have our, um, our racial issues in the United States, but they also exist in China. And the major downside uh, uh, to, 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 of Chinese investment in Africa is that China has a non-interference policy. In other words, investments are not associated to corporate governance, whereas the World Bank, the EU, and the American entrepreneurs will insist on meeting high standards of corporate governance and probity in politics. The Chinese care more about profit and money. And some years ago, I was watching Fareed Zakaria on CNN, and he said that because of the rise of Chinese investment in Africa, one index argued at the time that corruption was actually on the, in, on the increase, the Ibram index. So Africans were now awash with cash from China, so they had less incentive to improve corporate governance. This is what I consider to be a major downside. I, I think there's some truth to that. Uh, again, this is a, a huge topic that would go on for an extended period of discussion. Uh, I think it, it is important just to keep in mind, maybe without getting into the details now, that uh, China makes the point that it uh, does not impose politics or political conditionality on its relationships with the African countries. And to some extent, that's true. On the other hand, there are core issues in China that if you are an African government, you will not say anything negative about China or you do so at your peril. Uh, if you are critical of China's policy in Xinjiang province concerning the Uyghurs or 
their policy on Hong Kong or the island building in the South China Sea or Tibet or human rights policies, uh, you as an African government are going to be in deep, deep trouble uh, with your relationship with China. So in a sense, there is, um, there is some sort of subtle uh, political conditionality going on that is not acknowledged. All right. So Ambassador, we had an interesting discussion. I thoroughly enjoyed it, but unfortunately I have to wrap up, so bye. Thank you very much. Good luck to you. All right, bye. Bye-bye.